I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that very much. Uh, in January, the Department of the Interior released a draft offshore leasing plan covering uh, 2017 to 2022, which proposed opening part of the Atlantic, including areas off the coast of Virginia, my home state, although I represent the mountains and the cold uh, territory uh, and don't have the coast. I do uh, obviously care about what happens in Virginia very much, and they would open that up for oil and gas leasing. Mr. Sminsky, I would have to ask, um, they made it 50 miles off the shore of the coast. Uh, DOD had some concerns there. And I'm just curious, have you, does your organization have any idea of whether or not DOD's had problems in the Gulf of Mexico dealing with uh, oil exploration or natural gas exploration? Well, the, I'm I'm from the Department of Energy. I understand. So, <laughs> uh, the the opening of those leases. I mean, I think that we're now seeing production rising in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and and that's you know in the aftermath of the Macondo spill. Uh, I think the issues associated with um, offshore leasing uh, tend to be uh, environmentally oriented. There are some people that that are concerned about the impacts on water and uh, the environment and generally climate. And generally, we believe if you open up the Mid-Atlantic, uh, you would agree or that the data indicates that there's a, an abundant energy source out there, even though we don't have any, any recent yeah, from data. From time to time, EIA has looked at, at uh, what the resource base is uh, around the United States, and there's a possibility that there are both oil and gas resources in the Mid-Atlantic. And the last time any real research was done was back, a bit, I believe, about 1980. Um, and, and it takes about 10 years to go from start to finish, and we're just now getting started, but we're 50 miles out, which it would be better, I think, if we were closer in. I, I find that interesting, and you all wouldn't have any way of knowing this, but I voted on my first resolution as a mem member of the Virginia legislature in 2004 requesting that we go down this road. And uh, am I not correct that it takes about 10 years to go from start to finish and that if we had started in 2004 when the legislature first in asked the offshore this, area um, that's that's very typical and so if we'd started then we would already be seeing uh, both tax revenues and jobs and all kinds of things in the eastern part of the state wouldn't that be accurate I, I, I think the first thing that would happen is we probably end up updating all of that geologic information with modern 3D seismic technology and that kind of thing. So it, uh, the, the upfront part is actually spending money. Now there are jobs associated with that. Whether the revenues come in depends on what, what you find and how quickly you can produce it. But there's a pretty good indication that we, we've got a fair amount of natural gas and at least a little bit of oil. Isn't that, isn't that even based on the older technologies that showed up, did it not? The uh, Yes, I mean, the, we know that there's oil and gas in, in eastern Canada, and, uh, and those trends tend to move right down the coast. And the Canadians are already, uh, they've already got their straw dipped into that pool, don't they? That is correct. Yeah. So one might argue that the Canadians are buying or getting fuel out of that source and Selling it back, it might actually be flowing up to Canada from. Well, it's a pretty long way from. It the is a long way, Virginia. I agree. I agree. <laughs> that would I be a big see, straw. <laughs> I just want to see my folks getting some advantage uh, out of all of this. Look, I'll open this up for anybody who wants to take it. Uh, I think I already know the answer, but um, if the United States uh, is getting more oil and more natural gas, what impact would that have on, say, Russia? Iran, ISIS, even China. Who wants to take that? You want well, that? My, my microphone is turned on. I usually try to go. avoid answering questions, but let me <laughs> let me uh, let me comment that uh, it, listening. When you listen to the panel uh, here, uh, Congressman Griffith, I think that more production on the market, regardless of its source, is going to tend to lower prices and benefit consumers. So the I mean, that's true whether it's natural gas or, or oil or airline tickets. I mean, the more that you can put out there, the, the better off consumers are. But when a, a country is basing a big part of its uh, liquidity on energy and all of a sudden a, a new giant rises up 
or, an, or gets extra strength, that in essence would mean that at least for the Chinese, the Russians, and maybe even ISIS, uh, that it will negatively impact their ability to do things that we might be opposed to. Would you not agree? I, it's certainly, I mean, one of the factors that's out there, one of the, uh, very quickly, on looking at the time, the, this question of why there's such this wide range of, of views of oil prices, whether it's, you know, $20 or $30 or $100 and over, a lot of that has to do with not being able to pin down answers to many of these geopolitical questions. Is Venezuela going to have a problem in the near term producing their 2 million barrels a day of oil? What about Iraq? And because of ISIS, uh, what about production outages in places like Libya? And then on the downside, it's things like the economy in China and whether or not Libya is going to return to the market. And nobody, it, it's true, nobody has the answer. It's not EIA doesn't have the answers to that. Nobody does. Nobody has the answers. If I might, Mr. Chairman, indulge, uh, but aren't we better off if the United States is controlling more of that by having more production, because then if the Venezuelans do something or if there's a problem uh, somewhere else, at least our own internal economy is not negatively impacted as much, and aren't we in a much better position today than we were just five years ago, and hopefully we'll be in an even better position uh, I, ten I, years from now? I suspect that everybody on this panel would agree with you. And I would say to you that, that when this first started, our new boom in energy, which we can continue to use, particularly if we open up the Mid-Atlantic and keep looking for ways to do this, I used to feel that maybe my children wouldn't have the economy that we had. Now I believe if we don't screw it up here in Washington, our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren can live in the United States where we are still the number one economic nation in the world without a yield back. Can I just add one thing? I, I just don't want to separate one country that you mentioned. This is, a, this is a benefit to China. I mean, you mentioned Russia, Iran, ISIS. This, is, this hurts. This helps China. Huge net importer. Okay. This time I recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Harper, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair.